What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Gola Jr. That's me. With me, as always, Brandon Newman. Brandon, how was your weekend? It was great, Mike. How was yours? My weekend was good. I uh, I got to go back to Norman, Oklahoma for the first time in a long time, which was very interesting. Um, Can I tell was... you from Sloan's IG that you and I ate a, ate a similar item this weekend? So, yes, yeah, Sloan Martin, who's my play-by-play partner on Learfield Audio that you can check out for my job on the weekends. As for my job here, you can download, subscribe, rate, and review Gojo wherever you get your podcast. We appreciate you guys coming through and listening with us on a football Monday. Make sure you leave us five stars, rate us, review us. Check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel at the Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. playlist. We got an awesome football Monday coming up for you guys here. Plenty of reaction to what we saw over the weekend, a review of the thick six bets from last week. We give out roses on Monday around here. But, uh, yeah, so I, I went and called the uh, Oklahoma-Kansas State game this past weekend in Norman. Sloan Martin, who's my play-by-play partner in there. And, yeah, a big part of what we do every weekend is just going around there and trying out the eats. Because, Brandon, I said to them this weekend, and I realized it when I got down there, this was only, I think, the second game in the last three years that I've called at a place that I once played at before. Because this was the first time I had been to Gaylord Family Oklahoma Memorial Stadium since 2012 when I went down there and played with Notre Dame and we won that game. And so I legitimately had the moment where I was standing around down in the field and saw a spot and thought of a pressure that I gave up on the first third down of that game. And (laughs) other weird moments like that that were hardwired to remember because offensive offensive linemen are masochists, but... Uh, most of the rest of my time was spent trying to find stuff to eat around the stadium because, as you know, when we travel places as players, you don't get to eat shit away from the hotel. You eat the same thing that we eat every other place we go. Yeah, it's terrible. It's usually the same uh, stockpile meat and, and mashed potatoes and gravy and the same well, flavors of Gatorade. I would say it's terrible. Like, I mean, you usually there's like prime rib mixed in there. I am a guy who loves an appetizer trio just because I love some diversity when I'm eating. So it is terrible because it's monotonous and it's the same thing over and over again. So, yes, Mike, but obviously when it comes to football games, tradition and uh, superstition, you kind of want to eat the same things on a Thursday that you do going into game week. I love all that type of stuff. But, Mike, you and I both had corn dogs this weekend. And I tell you what, Mm. eating that meat – that deep fried meat off of a stick and then eating the, the crispy biting on the, the the stick at the very end after you ate the, all that corn dog part, Mike, it's something about it. It's something about it. So I, I'd say this. We play, We did a little different. We played corn dog roulette in the booth because they had a normal corn dog, a vegan corn dog, and then one that was just full of cheese. And so me, Sloan, and our wow. producer, Tom, each picked a different one. I ended up with the vegan dog, which honestly wasn't terrible. Like, I've had a bunch of vegan stuff before. I'm not totally averse to the concept. And it was still deep fried around a bunch of, you know, cornmeal yeah. or whatever the hell goes into a corn dog, which is excellent. Yeah, I, I, I imagine a vegan corn dog is delicious. I'm I'm a big v- vegan meat guy, as we've talked about on this podcast a lot. I like to try to eat things without mommies and daddies every now and then. Speaking of that, happy Meatless Monday for everyone out there. People who try to cut back on meat usually do Meatless Mondays. So, so shouts out to you, Warriors. Shouts out to you, Meatless Monday Warriors. Shouts out to the fine folks at The Mont in Norman, Oklahoma. I made the pilgrimage there. I got the Sooner Swirl at The Mont. I went to Rusty's Custard, which I had a concrete that sat in my stomach for the next probably 12 hours. It was delicious. Great food all around there. Very big fan. Enjoyed my time in Norman thoroughly, even though they probably won't be too happy to see me again because they were one of the big upsets of the weekend and Kansas came in, yeah. Kansas State came in and beat number six Oklahoma. But we won't dwell on the past, Brandon. We got another day for that one. Usually around here, NFL's on Monday. We'll get to a bunch of college football on Tuesday, so we will talk about that game yep. and what we saw the rest of the college football weekend. But uh, Brandon, uh, since we are going to have Football Monday, it's only right that we talk about the most important and grave gravitas, I guess would be the way, the subject with the most gravity around the NFL right now. Taylor Swift's not playing the Super Bowl halftime show. (laughs) I, I refuse to believe that that's the heaviest topic going into this week, and I believe it's pronounced gravitas. Gravitas? I don't know if that's where you use gravitas. 
<laughs> or maybe it is with the most gravitas. I mean, hey, y'all know I don't know my things, but if I have a vote, I'm 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 putting on gravitas. Brandon, gravitas. I don't know. Y'all know I don't know my things. Well, what we do know now <laughs> is that after last week, which ended with a bunch of rumors swirling about that Taylor Swift was going to be performing the Super Bowl halftime show. I think it started circulating in Variety. The NFL had put out a press release near midnight talking about Apple coming on, Apple Music, to be the new sponsor of the Super Bowl halftime show, which yes. ends the end of an era. Because I don't know if you remember, Brandon, when we were kids growing up, it used to be one-offs every year with the sponsorship until 2013 when Pepsi came along and signed a 10-year deal with the Super Bowl halftime show. So it's been the Pepsi halftime show since you and I graduated college. That Super Bowl after we graduated, really the same January that I played the national title game, that was the first Super Bowl of the Pepsi halftime show. And this last year, they decided not to renew because the NFL wanted more money. So they announced at midnight last week that it was going to be the Apple Music halftime show now. And Midnight, Taylor Swift, who is currently getting ready to release an album called Midnight, who is releasing yes. the titles of her new album tracks at Midnight on a, YouTube, on a social yes. media series, made everyone think that. The NFL came out and squashed that, as did Rihanna. She put on her social media page a picture of her hand host, uh, hoisting an NFL football. Uh, Rock Nation and company also put out the press release on this that Rihanna would be the first singer of the new Apple Music Super Bowl halftime show. So, Brandon, where are you at? What was your reaction to this initially? I was very, very, very excited. I also, also, I also feel like this is like one of those legacy x because jay-z and the rock and it was just like you know a part of jay-z getting a partnership with the nfl i feel like one of the line stipulations was you got to get rihanna to do a super bowl because rihanna just makes bangers and has a big following and everyone is waiting for rihanna music to drop now mike you're going to get into this a little bit later but this is perfect for us because she is now a legacy act she's a billionaire because she makes most of her money from selling her uh Fenty, Fenty beauty makeup line and and then her obviously her her clothing uh, lingerie and things like that so I'm I think it's great I love that she is the answer to people thinking that it was going to be Taylor Swift because I was going to have to wrap my mind around that like it seemed like a perfect partnership and it probably is in the works and is going to come later down the line let's not forget the fact that like once things get kind of once things get in the water, they kind of be, begin to manif manifest themselves over time. Yeah. But this being this is a big surprise for me, and I think a lot of people are waiting for Rihanna for a long time. Like people want Rihanna music out, period. So I think a best of in the form of a halftime show for the Super Bowl is is going to be just the best we can get. Yeah, I think a lot of people. You're right because as Rihanna was busy being pregnant, getting ready to have her first child. Everyone was yes. taking that as, a, all right, we're probably not getting new music anymore. Like you said, she has found so many other ways to make money and be happy, which is awesome. But it, it was, that was the first thing I thought of. Like you said, Legacy Act. It was what we realized last year when we were watching. Because we were all hot and bothered because it was Dre and Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Kendrick Lamar, Mary J. Blige, 50 Cent. And everyone our age who are, I guess, on the older side or like the middle of the millennial generation looked up and realized, holy shit, we're the marks now. Because Super Bowl mm. halftime shows almost always happen after they should have happened relative to max popularity, at least as of late. And we looked around yeah. in that act and said, wait a minute. Those were all the people that were popular when we were young, and now we're the ones with purchasing power, and so they're starting to cater these acts to us because they think that's what's current because these are also older people making these decisions, and it just reminded me that we are now olds. We are now in that ballpark, and because we have reached the purchasing power point, now our musical acts are starting to get the love on this big stage. Mike, I love it. I love I love being the prettiest girl at the ball, even if it means that they're trying to take our dollars finally. Like now that we have the dollars to spend, like yes, let's let's take it. The people that have those Apple Plus subscriptions that we're getting that nine ninety nine every month, let, we'll we'll bleed them dry. I liked the fact that this is more of a bridge of a gap, Rihanna, because uh, as I saw someone tweet when it when the news came out, and it was about Taylor Swift. They was like. Ooh, it seems like a hard turn to go from Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, 50 Cent, and Eminem and Kendrick Lamar to, to Taylor Swift the next year. 
I think Rihanna can bridge the gap a little bit more. I think this is going to kind of be a little bit more of a through line. Yeah, and I mean, people act came to me because obviously I was super psyched about Taylor Swift, and they're like, "Oh, are you okay? How do you feel about this?" Like, obviously, I'm pumped about Rihanna doing this. I, mean, I don't feel like on, anyone yeah. could be not excited about Rihanna doing this because I remember there was a while where a lot of people, and not me, because Bayhive, I don't want you to come for me, but a lot of people Talk started doing that thing where they were talking about hit for hit Rihanna versus Beyonce, who was really more about that. And I don't want to have that conversation because I value my safety on the internet. And you know what, Brandon? I shouldn't say that all of the acts are not currently relevant because I think it's different at different times. But some of them at times can feel that way. And this one just kind of fell into that category because I realized Rihanna hadn't put out a new full album of her own since 2016. Like, was it anti oh, nope, anti nope. or anti? That was 2016. She had yep, put out anti. a single. She had put out a single with Party Next Door in 2020. Her last album was in 2016, and so we are operating off dated software. That being said, we are in a world that still swag surfs currently. I hear plenty of songs on pregame warm up tracks <laughs> all across the country that were played during ours. So, Brandon, tell me where you're at on these songs. I'm going to read off a bunch of Rihanna songs, and you tell me yay or nay on if they should be involved in the Super Bowl halftime show set. Okay. All right? Talk to me. Yep. All right. Ponda replay. Yeah, they open with that one. That just gets people started. They're like, oh, I think I've heard this before. So the only reason I disagree is because the one I was saving for second was I think they open we we found love. You don't think you don't think that like to open it up? That's that's the crescendo when everyone's like, okay, I'm out of Rihanna hits that I know. And then it's like, we found love, you know? And everybody's like, oh, I thought this was Katy Perry. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we know that one's going to play a prominent note role. Yes. Work. Oh, what? I'm okay. I'm glad you brought up work, Mike. I'm glad you brought up work because the other one I want to bring up is What's My Name? Two of them featured by Drake. Okay. Ooh. And if we want to go to Drake's albums, there's a couple Ooh. more Rihanna Drake bangers. And I think this... Rihanna at at the Super Bowl is the way to get Drake to the Super Bowl. Canada, uh, Canada, Canada's finest, to Toronto, the North Boy, Top Boy is going to come down and and do the Super Bowl in Arizona. I think it's time, Mike. Because I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, Drake and Rihanna once had a thing very popularly. Uh, they were dating kind of on or off. They both have like, each other's. Uh, I feel like that was they both pretty have one, each other's. I feel like that was pretty one sided. Like Rihanna had Drake in the stable. It's not. It's not. It, I I think it was definitely both. Um, they both have each other's birthdays tattooed on them. Like they they share something. At when when ASAP Rocky, her her the father of her child, uh, became the father of her child. Everyone just start thinking about Drake. There's a bunch of Drake, ASAP Rocky, Rihanna memes because they are so connected and tied. So I'm all I all I imagine, by the way, when that Super happened Bowl, was Dra was Drake leaving her all of Marvin's room as a voicemail. <laughs> like he actually put that song into practice. I said the other week that Adam Levine has written so many songs with Maroon 5 about the exact situation of having to beg for forgiveness after infidelity. Ooh. I feel like Drake also has written so many songs that would apply to his life and the relationships with like real or perceived between like him and Rihanna and Nicki Minaj that would apply to situations he finds oh, himself man. in. So I feel like Marvin's hey, room would definitely just... apply there. Yeah, and that's also just scratching the surface of the exploits uh, that Drake's been. He famously dated Serena before she uh, en ended up with her husband. Um, might be some good luck Chuck stuff with, with Drake there. Um, but I, let, I, well, I would say this. Work is not going to be there. If there's a Drake song collab, it's going to be What's My Name. All right. All right. You're going to bet on What's work, My Name works, over works work. Too, yeah, works works to uh, sexualize. It's a little bit too much for the for the Disney audience that watches the Super Bowl. So, for that reason, do you think S and M and Cake will also be out? S S No, that's not. Is what's S? No, you you were thinking of S O S. Please, someone oh, yeah. help SOS me. S O S gonna be there. S O S gonna be there. Yeah, but no, I, Cake Cake. Which one's Cake? So Cake is a song I, I think was a feature with her and Chris Brown. I don't remember whose song it was oh, technically. Oh, yes. Um, no, no, no. Didn't know. 
anything with Chris Brown is tainted. S and M is the sticks and stones they break my bones, but chains and whips excite me. Nah, nah, nah. Come on. Oh yes, yeah, no, no. You know what that's going to be the, uh, replaced by. Now this was popular when we was out going uh, going out to practice. Disturbia. I, so that? that one I had on the list, Disturbia has to be there. And apps, that one takes me back. Brandon, you're right. That was the one that most brought me back to college was Disturbia. I don't know. Though. I, Pat Kuntz used to play that, or I don't know who it was. Somebody used to play that in the locker room before every practice, and I would like jokingly use it to kind of hype me up, and it worked. Like, Disturbia, well, like it, it's. It's, you know what messed me up with there. Disturbia is Disturbia and um, She Wolf came out around the same time. Ooh, yes, and <laughs> yes, and they both like kind of have a similar vibe, but are a little bit <laughs> yes. different. And so I always remember the two of those together. So I'm with you, Disturbia. A hundred percent will be there. Now, don't stop the music. Do we think that's got a place anywhere in there, <sighs> Mike? Like, don't you know they do some transition songs? That's what I felt like for that one, is it's got... There's yeah. a couple of songs that are good enough short burst beats to get you from one to another, which also, by the, the way, course. is where I think... Of just... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, that's where I think Lemon gets in, that she did with N.E.R.D. Ooh. I, I it's don't, it's I, a great I, upbeat tempo that I feel like is really good for the energy of a Super Bowl halftime show, and it's one of the newer singles she was a part of. Yes, but I don't think it was big enough. Like the dance break, I feel you, but like I, where where what you were like that um, was the song we were talking about. But it's like I wanna take you away. The music like it's gonna be. It's got it has to be an upbeat. It has to be upbeat, a, a upbeat chorus to to make it. Which brings me to one another one. Jay Z, Kanye West. Rihanna, run this town tonight. Oh, you talking about college, Mike? We used oh. to warm up to that song, and that was a banger. Wow, that was a banger. Brandon, I hadn't included that one on the list. It's absolutely got to be there. That's another one. Who knows? Like, obviously, you're not going to bring Kanye with that. I wonder if this is a point where Jay Z makes a trip out on stage now. Now that he's got more rock family involved in this. <gasps> Honestly, that's got to be the, that's got to be the crescendo. And I know I don't want to take your list, but Umbrella was her first single featuring Jay Z, and Jay Z was the person that found Rihanna. I think Umbrella's got to be. Does Umbrella there. have the energy that's going to bring you to the Super Bowl halftime show, Brandon? There is a opportunity to make it fake rain on that field and her Ooh. to sing her hearts out like she was. 17, 22, 18, however she was when she first came out all over again. And talking about legacy acts, Mike, these are these are going to be people that are paying money to see this or to hear this or to buy an album that was in a skate rink listening to this. Like, I think I think the longevity part, like if Bruce Springsteen can, be, can, can, uh, can headline a Super Bowl, then Umbrella can be a part of a Rihanna set. Hot take, I think skate rings are more popular now than they were when we were kids and when this song would have come out. I think for some weird reason, that's become our post-COVID kink, and I think TikTok's wow. partially to blame for that, but I think they're more popular now than they were back then. That's just something I'm willing to run with, but... We do need help. Anyone else, if we missed any Rihanna songs that should be in the Super Bowl halftime show, at Gojo Show on Twitter, download, subscribe, rate, and review Gojo wherever you get your podcast, five-star rating, and the Rihanna set list that you think should make its way to the Super Bowl halftime show. Brandon, before we move on, did I miss one that you wanted to get in? Thank you. Just want shut up and drive. It's another one of those, like, big chords. Shut up and drive. It's all so sassy. It's that's why it's, I think Rihanna's the best is because it allows you to be really sassy in a way that's really oh effortless and endearing for her and for the rest of us is totally unnatural and so she takes us to a place that we can't otherwise go. And what's better than that? Yeah, look at that look at that baddie go. Mm. Bad well, girl Riri. Won't she, won't she do it, man? Bad girl Riri. I'm glad. You know what? I'm glad of nothing else. She's going to have her moment where everyone has to come through and like gets to celebrate her communally again because we've done a lot of fangirling the pregnancy pictures, everyone ood and odd over that because she was gorgeous yes. in the middle of this process. I'm glad she gets a group celebration again because she has long deserved it. We're going to get off Rihanna, but you guys too, you guys are twins in this way as well. Stick figures as your avatars on social media. See? 
Me and Riri. A lot, so, lot more in yeah. common. Some forearm tattoos and stuff prominently displayed in pictures. Man. General Come baddie vibes. <laughs> General baddie. General baddie. <laughs> Speaking of baddies, uh, Brandon, Sunday Night Football, the return of Jimmy Garoppolo, who is a certified baddie in his own right. Man. <laughs> but unfortunately, this game was just flat out fucking bad. <laughs> Um, the 49ers <laughs> lost to the Broncos 11 to 10 on Sunday night football in one of I the grossest it. games I have ever seen. Brandon, this history game, was made, Mike. History, history was made. History was made in this game, Brandon. We had a night where the 49ers were 0 for 7 on third down, <laughs> where the Broncos were a 3 for 13, outclassing them there. And there were 14 total punts between both teams. It was disgusting, but Brandon, you're right. We had history made in a far bigger way because better than any takeaway that we can have coming off of this game that was ugly as sin, that was essentially what the Rutgers-Iowa football game and college football was supposed to be, a punt fiesta full of world-class unders for everyone involved laying down money. This game featured a passing of the torch. Because Jimmy Garoppolo did not just come back to sit idly by in Trey Lance's stead. No, he came back to make history. History that would help one of our dear friends in Dan Orlovsky. Because late in this game, Jimmy Garoppolo, taking a snap in the shadow of his own end zone, took a deep drop back on a play that looked like it was supposed to be some sort of middle screen. They were basically at their goal line. And Jimmy G went to back up as one would on a screen, losing a little more ground, and set his feet firmly in the middle of end racism out of the back of the end zone for a safety (laughs) that, I mean, not a single second sooner than he had stepped into the middle of the NFL's attempt to try and stop racism in America. Finally, Mike Tirico on the broadcast immediately just burped out, like Dan Orlovsky! (laughs) And with that moment, Dan Orlovsky was freed, Brandon. He sent out the tweet. He felt so liberated. I was so happy for him because now he got to pass the baton and Jimmy Garoppolo will now be the most recent stepped out of the end zone guy. Oh, my gosh. Yes, Mike. I want to focus on that, but I can't get my mind out of your setup and the end racism straight to the Mike Tirico call. It's just too much for me right now. But (laughs) you're absolutely right. (laughs) And congratulations to Dan Orlovsky. Uh, Also, history made second time in NFL's history that a final score of an NFL game was 11 to 10. Which I think is oh, pretty, man. so pretty yeah. A lot of a lot of people were rooting for Scorigami. Everyone wants to find those scores that we've never had in NFL history. So second still feels like we were a part of something pretty special there. Oh my! I mean, yeah, we we stayed up and watched it, and also the first time since 2016 that a team won after punting for uh, ten plus times. So yes, you you mentioned it. It it was it was uh, crazy. We got a chance to see Russell Wilson decide. You know what? I'm going to do the thing that they paid me to do. Like, I'm going to win, I'm gonna win the football game games. Life. No, like, change, affect the game with his feet for once. Like, like we understand you want to pass the ball only, Mr. Russell Wilson, but like, that's not, that's God, God gave you those legs for a reason. Like, you were an inspiration to Kyler Murray for a reason. Go, go out there and do them things. By the way, updating it, it was. Uh, the Broncos 6 for 19 on third down and San Fran 1 for 10. So I had missed one added on at the end there late in the game as they were driving with an, uh, driving with an attempt to bring this back. But you're right. That From a football standpoint, that was the story of the game was this was still coming off a weekend where for Nathaniel Hackett, who had been the butt of about every NFL joke, the head coach for the Broncos, went out and hired a game management coach before this game someone whose responsibilities would essentially be taking off his plate some of the things that he had messed up early in this and i know it is going to be an embarrassing headline there's no way around that but i think generally looking at it and saying early in your head coaching tenure hey this is something i'm not great at and so i better get as much help as possible it sucks that the news was as public as it was and you got shefty and these guys tweeting about it but i actually don't have a problem with the end result now you might have to have a talk with your decision coach because you went 0 for 2 on challenges during the night. So that's not super great. And this was still a game that, I mean, if you were a fan of defensive line play in football in that regard, my dad was on the call with Westwood One on radio. I mean, I don't think he was wearing pants for half the broadcast because these D-lines kicked the shit 
out of the opposing offensive lines from start to finish in this game. It was not remotely close. They would have been better off letting the two defenses go beat each other up out there. So it was an ugly, ugly game all the way through. Ten punts in the first half was the most in one half so far this season. Unfortunately, on the Jimmy G. Orlovsky play, Trent Williams, their star left tackle for the 49ers, also left that game with an ankle injury on that same play and did not return. So that was a huge bummer and deeply impactful for the 49ers. So, Brandon, for Russ and the Broncos, I still don't think that's going to be a great football team or a great offense. It seems like the only play in their playbook is Russ throwing a swing pad in, pass into the flat. Um, their offensive line, like we said, coming off week one, I think is going to get popped for more and more holding calls on the edges, and that's going to make things difficult for them behind the chains. But Russ, like you said, after the last couple years of not using his legs a ton, decided on the drive that ended up being the game-winning score for them to take off and run a little bit, and you saw the way that it affected defenses. But he's going to be there. Like I said, the question for them is going to be if Nathaniel Hackett can do things egregiously enough to infringe on his job in year one. Russ is going to be there, though. My question more for this game was with the guy who stepped out of the back of the end zone. Because while it was funny as shit for all of us to watch, I'm sure for Jimmy it obviously wasn't a great time. And he's been super popular as of late. There's been a growing faction of people who looked at what was happening with Trey Lance to start the season and thought, man, you're turning away from a guy who you've gone to a Super Bowl with and who's capable of so much. You brought him back here. Trey Lance had struggled a little bit passing early. I'm wondering how soon it's going to take for people to turn on Jimmy G. Because I think down the stretch of that time after the Super Bowl, we all looked at him after that Super Bowl loss and said, your fault. You can't hit deep passes that Kyle Shanahan dials up for you. Your fault. And so now we did the thing where he's the backup quarterback and you get that glow up. I'm wondering how much more of this. Because across the board wasn't a great game for either quarterback. I will you know, be open and honest with that. It wasn't like on the other side you had Russ lighting it up here. Uh, Jimmy G, 18 for 29, 211, one touchdown and one interception. Russ, 20 for 33, 184, no touchdowns, no interceptions, and both got sacked four times. People already feel some type of way about Russ. I'm just wondering, Brandon, how soon the turn happens on Jimmy G because I think it's coming. But the, I think the turn has happened because in that stat line comparing quarterbacks, quarterbacks, Jimmy G won in the bad good debate because he got that safety, right? Like I think, I think what we are seeing and the reason why I think the tide has turned on Jimmy G this early on is that it looks a lot like the bad Jimmy G to why people were excited about Trey Lance. Right. Right. Like him just being bad inexplicably and kind of just very head scratchy and just punts after punts and 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 an offense that we know is good and we know has weapons and players just not be able to gel together in that defense, get worn out because they just continue to get back on the field. And the special teams really aren't helping out much either. But the, the team looks like they are going behind Jimmy G and they are stopping behind Jimmy G. Yeah, and that's the way it's always been. When he's healthy and on the field, he's capable of winning you a bunch of games. It's always about the high-end playmaking and be able to over... And he had some throws down the stretch that were good throws while he was under duress. This offensive line that had to reshuffle once Trent went out in the second half wasn't the same after that. You don't lose a guy like that and be able to operate the same, especially against the D-line on the other side that was getting plenty of pressure here. Bradley Chubb and that duo were living in the backfield. So part of it, like, it's not always going to be that hard on Jimmy G either. This was a really good defensive performance by both sides. And so I I don't think they've turned on him now, and I don't think it's going to be soon. But I think there's going to be little moments like this sprinkled through along the way that are going to kind of lift the rose-colored glasses off everyone that they're looking at Jimmy G with right now and remind them of what they saw all along. A guy who was good, not great. A guy who was Jared Goff tangent. A guy who was good enough to get you to places that your roster is capable of. And we talk about this in a very different way, I think, right now with Jalen Hurts and that Eagles roster. He is playing very well, but he is playing on a roster when I heard Mina Kimes say this, he doesn't need to play great for them to be a Super Bowl contender. And I think that was always the thought process with Jimmy G until it wasn't. And so I think there are going to be enough moments like this sprinkled across 
then I don't know if it'll be a full-scale riot, but I think it'll definitely make some people think differently about the way that they look at Jimmy Garoppolo after that. So we won't spend too much more time on that slop heap of a game. It was pretty terrible. And we had good football that was played over the rest of the day. But did want to commemorate the new grand champion running out of the back of the end zone. Jimmy Garoppolo, enjoy having that gif used against you for the rest of your life. Enjoy that being the highlight people run. Uh, Dan Orlovsky, enjoy freedom, man. Enjoy retirement. This is a beautiful moment for you, and I look forward to seeing him all over the four-letter network coming up today, taking his victory lap. Dan still ran a really long way out of the end zone. I went back and watched his highlight again, and it's <laughs> it's damn impressive. But um, Brandon, we had another incredibly memeable viral moment in the game of the day. Uh, Bill's Dolphins. The AFC oh, East clash man. of the two top teams in that division and two of the best teams in that conference – uh, went off, and this is a game Miami ultimately was able to win. If you're looking just at the box score, it was 21-19 Miami, and if you're just looking at the box score, you're going to have no idea how Miami managed to pull this off because Buffalo outgained them in almost every meaningful statistic in every aspect of the game. The difference of this game, Brandon, comes down to in a game where Josh Allen had to go out there and throw the ball 63 times to two as 18 attempts. Josh Allen and company, who looked across and watched Miami run, I believe, 38 or 39 plays. I know they didn't crack 40 plays on the day. But what it ended up being, Brandon, was a team that just made too many mistakes in Buffalo. And we can talk, it was certainly tied to injury in this game. You look, they were down five defensive starters over the course of this game. I think they had an offensive lineman go out in the middle of this game also. Defensively, we knew this was going to be a tough day for them. But offensively, a Josh Allen turnover backed up where he gets sacked that ends up in Miami points. A missed field goal in this game for Buffalo. A drop touchdown pass by Gabe Davis. All these little mistakes that started to add up that have you go two for four in the red zone, lose the turnover battle, and have almost double the penalties also that Miami had allowed them to sneak through and win this game. It's the second straight week, Brandon, where a lot of me looked at the totality of this game, understanding what Buffalo was missing, and like when Miami beat the Ravens last week, say, all right, if all things are equal, I still probably believe Buffalo's a better team. But Miami's found a way to win this game now, back-to-back weeks, including a game where their quarterback in Tua Tungavailoa was knocked out at the end of the first half, and we weren't sure if he was able to come back in. And Brandon, I think that's going to be one of the biggest questions coming off this game is, is the NFL in some danger, depending on what happens with Tua Tungavailoa here? Because Tua took a big hit at the uh, about the two-minute warning of the first half. And he falls backwards, and it looks like the back of his head hits off the turf. And he gets up, and he is wobbling. And his teammates have to come over and stop. They take him off. He goes in for halftime, and Teddy B comes out and finishes out the rest of that half. And we're all like, oh, he's for sure done. Then we start seeing reports from the team and Ian Rappaport that it was a back injury that locked up, and it aggravated him enough. And that was what caused him to look wobbly. The NFLPA is now asking for an investigation into the concussion protocol to make sure that it was followed in this case. And Brandon, I don't know, I've had a lot of back injuries over the years, and that didn't look like that. Now, Tua came out and played the entire second half and didn't appear to exhibit any signs of someone who had dealt with a head injury, didn't look out of sorts. There wasn't another one of those ugly viral moments during the rest of that game, but how did you feel seeing that with Miami's quarterback? I, I definitely thought it was a head injury first just because of how he got together, stood up, and then started wobbling. But, I mean, we saw Trey Lance get up and try to put weight on a foot that wasn't in the right direction. So I do I do think that there's a chance that there's that, that pinched nerve that you kind of feel in your lower back and you kind of like, oh, oh, I guess I shouldn't be standing up right now. So I will say this. I, I, I love the conspiracy concept that – they forced him back out there. Was, somebody came downstairs and was like, "Actually, Tua, uh, that's that's uh, a that's the AFC East champion right there. That might be the best team in the NFL. We need you to go out there and finish this thing. We can't have Teddy B go out there and finish it." But those 
it was all about camera angles. When I got a chance to see Tua's face make some decisions in the red zone and, like, read the defense and point stuff out, that's when I was like, oh, he's not concussed. Like, this isn't somebody suffering from a concussion. And I, obviously, I'm not a doctor, but he didn't look like somebody who was struggling with that. And I, I, the quote after the game, when asked about his back and his, and his head, and he said, those things are getting looked at, or those things will be checked up on, but I feel fine, especially after a big win. So, hey. Like, well, I was waiting for him to say something that make him sound more like Charles Barkley to make me get my antennas raised. Like, oh, maybe two is suffering something between the ears. But he seems fine. And more importantly, the Dolphins, in my opinion, look better than the Bills, Mike. Because not only was Josh Allen having some questionable things, he was forced into those decisions because they were tackling out there, Mike. Like, Holland, like – I saw bodies staying on the ground for long periods of time from the from the Buffalo Bills after clean tackles from the uh, from the Miami Dolphins on defense. Oh, listen, Miami's defense deserves a ton of credit. There's no doubt. They had a clear plan, which is they were going to force the issue. They were they had a great blitz package dialed up where they started the game bringing 5 and 6, bringing more than Buffalo could block and then kind of went from there into a lot of simulated pressures where they bring all those guys up and then you'd rush 3D linemen and bring a corner or 3D linemen and bring a guy from another angle outside there from the second level and it affected Buffalo and they were able to hit Josh Allen a lot they sacked him four times but it felt like they hit him way more than that over the course of the long game and Josh Allen had three fumbles in this game I think two of them were snap related though and one of them was actually him getting hit but there's just a lot of contact for him over the game Brandon and as we had heard for the first couple weeks of the season there was all this talk about using Josh a little bit less in the designed run game to start the year knowing you want to save those bullets on his body for when you get to the postseason you want that to be in the games that really matter that you think you're going to be involved in and Miami just said, no, we trust our secondary in the back end. And Gabe Davis was back for Buffalo. Stephon Diggs was out there for Buffalo. So you had those guys out there for the, mo- for the majority of this game. Dawson Knox out there as well. But Miami's defense definitely forced the issue. Miami's offense was efficient. Tua Tonga Bailo in the second half had a couple of really nice deep balls, timely deep balls to Jalen Waddell that got them in position to go and score when they needed to. And so I don't want to mitigate that. Miami is one of the best teams in the AFC right now. And for Buffalo, now the injury concerns start to mount because you were down both of your starting star safeties and Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. Uh, Micah Hyde, who I believe you lost for the year for a neck injury, which is a devastating injury. You were down five starters overall. So all of that stuff starts to add up. But And I think with that, Brandon, you combine that, the amount of guys that you were missing. So the added strain that puts on you up and down here it being early in the season and you being kind of used to having your way, right? Buffalo had been an absolute shredding machine on the Rams and the Titans the first two games that we had seen them in the season. And now things got difficult. And then you saw moments like at the end of the half when they're driving to try and set up a field goal and everyone thought Josh Allen went fake spike and tried to throw the ball out there when in actuality they botched the exchange. And for anyone that doesn't know that rule, if you botch that and then go to spike it, if it's not done immediately after taking the snap, that's intentional grounding and it's a penalty. It was a heads-up play by Josh to an extent to whip it out there. The smarter play would have been to burn it at the receiver's feet, so you stop the clock. But instead, you have that moment there where they run out of time in the first half and it costs them a chance at three points. And then you have that happen at the end of the game where you saw a very frustrated Josh Allen and a very frustrated Ken Dorsey up in the booth spiking the tablet in front of that TV Ooh, monitor. I yes. was speaking of people who are relieved of meme duty Tommy Reese you can go ahead and take a breather and get some water because the Buffalo box (laughs) up there some guy actually had the wherewithal in the middle of that coach having an absolute tantrum on behalf of that uh, tablet to put their hand over the camera so they wouldn't see any more of that it was electric but that was the frustration because once again in that key moment when they're trying to drive to potentially win this game you had them not able to get up to the line get set and get the spike off in time and so they go down like a batter with the bat on their back and he absolutely lost his shit i i loved it mike but that talk about the game the i think ken dorsey was so pissed off because the team didn't look like his team like he's like what is actually going on out there because they were beat the f up stefan diggs 
spent a lot of time on the sidelines after just standard tackles in this in this conversation. Well, this it was game. also hot as shit down there, which is the other portion of this, Brandon. True. This was a game that was, I think, about a hunt like the feels like temperature was about a hundred down there with the Miami humidity. And these guys were wearing it. Both teams, it looked like a couple of drunks at the end of a long fight. Uh, it Honestly, it, it reminded me of like Rocky and Apollo fighting at the end, where everyone's exhausted just throwing haymakers. I wanted them to keep the cameras rolling on the field so bad because you saw multiple guys lay down on the field. Dolphins and Bills just laying down out there. Melvin I thought for Ingram. sure someone was going to puke. I thought for sure. I mean, we, we got a chance to see uh, Lazar puke. Um, was that Lazard we saw puke uh, on the sideline th- today? It was another hot game that we saw a wide receiver puke. This, oh, yeah, this, it was. This, it was, uh, it was Green Bay and Tampa where there was also like a live hornet's nest lodged on the goalpost in one side because they hadn't gone out there and cleaned it the right way. <laughs> the B-cam. It was so crazy. But, yes, honestly, Mike, I, I am willing to say that the Dolphins are the better football team right now because Josh Allen really did just look like a, a version of Josh Allen that was those first couple years in the season where like he had a possibility but if he would just complete the pass or throw it to the right receiver throw it to their hands or if the receiver catches it uh, all these different variables that lead to them being the bills that were the ass kickers that led up into this game I mean, obviously playing in Miami obviously yes they they have an advantage but it shouldn't be an advantage to like to heat stroke a team uh, out of a win. I actually think that the Dolphins look like a more complete complimentary team. Like, like you said, they kicked a punt into, they, they kicked the punt into a safety. Is that, is that? Uh, yeah, a, I was going to say, I wouldn't give it? the special teams too much credit for the Miami Dolphins because Thomas Morstead, their punter was forced to punt from like a sawed off. It, they were backed up into their end zone. The snap distance is usually yes. 15 yards. It was 10 because they were so backed up. And he punted that ball directly off the personal protector's ass out the back of the end zone for a safety. It was the second most important visual of the day outside of Jimmy Garoppolo stepping out of the back of the end zone because that one had more history on its side. Although this one now is about a decade after the butt fumble. And I saw Mark Sanchez coming out and saying, hey, ease up. This is my turf. As if he somehow wants to hold on to that. But... Thomas Morstead and company get the now the and I'll make Chris Cody proud on this the bunt the butt punt. Ooh, I like that. I like that. But like Wilkins, uh, I don't know if you saw that one play where Wilkins got his helmet taken off by Josh Allen in a in a pit of rage, uh, and it just it just seems like he, the entire Buffalo Bills team was out of sorts, and to, for them to show holes this early in the season, I see Brandon. That's where I'll disagree. I don't think they're holes. I think the holes were injury. I think Miami's defense did a good job forcing the issue, and I think these teams genuinely have a little bit of animosity because Miami has guys okay. like Christian that will talk their shit, and Josh will too. And I enjoyed seeing that back and forth today. I'll push back. I thought Josh Allen still bailed them out of a lot of stuff. By the end, I just think he had taken so many hits. And I'm wondering if he's getting anything looked at after. Because some of those throws down the stretch looked Mm. like hurt throws. They didn't look like bad Josh throws. They looked like a guy who's used to being able to throw off platform and without his base totally underneath him that didn't have that all of a sudden. Because Josh Allen finished this game 42 of 63 for 400 yards and two touchdowns and was also their leading rusher. This was a game where Josh Allen had to do a little bit too much of everything for the Bills. Their dump-off passing game to the running backs ended up being their rushing attack for most of this game outside of a couple of nice runs. And so... I still have a lot of confidence in Josh Allen, but we were asking questions through the first couple of weeks. Is it possible to beat this team? What do you have to do to beat this team? You got to beat them up, and you got to you know hope that most of their secondary is out with injury. But defensively, if you were looking for something that I'm sure other teams are going to look at now, provided you've got the personnel on the back end to hold up, is all right. Josh Allen, who had been pretty damn good against the blitz against Miami for a long time, they said we'll heat you up. We'll try and live with you making a few big plays over the top, and Josh still did, knowing that eventually we're going to hurt you enough in the long run to make this a game that we can trim the margins and win. Well, it's just too bad the most talented dual-threat quarterback couldn't get it done for his team uh, when it really mattered and everybody needed him to. But, Mike, I want to go to the Miami Dolphins, who have a very short week getting ready for Thursday Night Football 
at Cincinnati against Joe Burrow and the in the Bengals that just got their win, Mike, this is going to be very very fun to watch. And I and I, I this is going to be the biggest test for Mike McDaniel thus far as like kind of game management in, in this short week time period. Like after this like hard fought game for the Dolphins, obviously they won big, but I'm I'm interested. This is going to be the trap game that's going to end up being. Uh, I, it's one of those like I think it's going to be one of those hammer the under games. Yeah, well, it's going to be definitely be sloppy coming off the short week. We mentioned both teams were exhausted, so now you've got that twi- quick turnaround of trying to just even get the fluids back in you, get your body back to base camp down there. And then Tua, that portion of it, depending on what the NFL's PA's investigation into their handling of the concussion protocol provides back here, how he's feeling in general, if this was truly a back injury, all those things going to play a huge role into what happens for Miami going into this week. Because, yes, the Bengals did get a win in a game that I thought should have been the first game exported to London. Just seeing the Jets and the Bengals out there made me feel like I was watching the old version of both teams that were really bad for a long time. And I didn't like it very much. Um, The uh, other good game of the day, and uh, I'd say a game I'm less interested in long term was the Packers and the Bucks. Everyone did the thing because they weren't sure if this is going to be the last time that we saw Brady and Aaron Rodgers play against each other. And I don't know if you saw their interaction after the game. It was about as cold and sterile as any two people who are quote-unquote friends. And they've played against each other in the match during the offseason as a part of that golf showcase. I'm sure they know each other and are somewhat familiar. It was a really cold brush-off at the end of that game for both of them. And just having that side-by-side with watching Federer and Nadal next to each other, both sobbing Mm -hmm. at the end of Roger's career, having that as the juxtaposition right by there was just hilarious to consider. And a reminder that these guys probably don't like each other all that much. Well, I don't know about that, Mike. I I would say I would agree with you. I want it to be the case. I want you to be right with this narrative. But I think it's like uh, the relationship is dictated based on what the the hierarchy person is feeling. So after a Bucks win, that interaction is usually pretty fine. You know, it's like, hey, what's up, Tom? Because Aaron Rodgers has that, like, big Lombowski type of attitude where he really don't know if he cares or not right in that well, moment. And we saw this was a criticism that Ryan Fitzpatrick offered up when he was doing the podcast circuit that yes. Tom Brady, after he beat them, just dusted him and went into the locker room. So you're right. Tom Brady being on the losing side of this definitely affects how that interaction was going to go. There's no doubt. So the Packers won 14-12 in that one, which we'll get to the thick six picks later on, but that was a very easy under to predict considering that Tampa Bay had none of their main wide receivers going into this game. Julio Jones down with an injury. Uh, Mike Evans suspended for this game. Chris Godwin still dealing with the lingering hamstring injury. Kyle Rudolph, our boy, got up there and finally got a catch in a Bucks uniform, which we were very excited about. Um, first, first, uh, One of the first first downs of the game. So had that... Um, Cole Beasley got his first action in a Bucks uniform also. But Brandon, this is another game like we talked about with the Bills defense where I'm willing to forgive a bit knowing we're going to get some of the cavalry back. Because for Tampa on offense, Tristan Wirfs, who was a, just a rookie a couple of years ago, was now, I believe, the only guy that was a starter last year out in the offensive line during the course of this game because of all the injuries that they've suffered. We mentioned everything that went on receiver. This was another game where it was two really good defenses that were teeing off on everyone. And then Aaron Rodgers just had more weapons than Tom that he was used to. David Bakhtiari, important note for the Packers, back in this game on a pitch count, he was rotating in at left tackle. And so they had the full complement of their offensive line for portions of that game. A.J. Dillon being in that backfield, using both of those guys in that backfield the way that they had all paid off and then Alan Lazard made a couple of big plays in the passing game that was down Sammy Watkins also Romeo Dobbs had a couple of really nice catches they were loving him up on the broadcast like Brandon I can see who both of these teams Uh, are going to be Randall Cobb don't forget yeah don't forget Randall Cobb Brand I guess the reason I'm less interested in the immediate result of this game is Tampa Bay season is going to be dictated by how healthy their offense is able to get and when you've got some guys that have an injury history some guys that are older you're relying on That can be a bigger if than most places, but the defense is lights out. We saw them putting in work on the other side. For Green Bay, I'm even less worried. They're starting to get more of those pieces back together now, and their defense showed a lot of their teeth as well. Rashawn Gary and those guys can really get after the quarterback, so 
Uh, I looked at this and just said, all right, it was cute for you guys to have what you thought was a photo op moment. We know both of these teams, especially with these quarterbacks, are going to be here in a week NFC in the long run. And it's really just about can they be healthy enough by the time we hit November and December. Um, Brandon, let's get to the couple of confusing games that we had today, though, uh, that started to make us ask questions. Uh, In week three here, the Colts managed to beat the Kansas City Chiefs this weekend and if you'd have told me that at the start of the season would have been less of a surprise the Colts getting a 27 win 2017 win in Indianapolis wouldn't have been a huge surprise if you had told me this preseason because I had picked this Colts team to win the AFC South this Colts team that had then spent the early portion of the season going out and engaging in ties with Houston and getting their asses whooped by the Jags which apparently is a theme that more people wanted to sign up for this weekend I wasn't sure who this Colts team was, and important for them, they got some help back in the Cavalry at the wide receiver room. Michael Pittman and um, Pierce, the wide receiver, Alec Pierce that they drafted out of Cincinnati, both came back 72 yards, 61 yards, respectively. Matt Ryan still got the shit beat out of him in this game, but he actually had some playmakers to get the ball to down the stretch. And they were able to pull this one off. So, Brandon, you buying any more? I guess the question really coming off this one is because Kansas City, we can get to some of the things that have been consistent for them, is does this make you more comfortable trusting the Colts now at this juncture of the season? Uh, Absolutely not. Uh, I feel like this is a narrative game. Uh, They needed that. A a team that is won and tied has nothing to fear and, and nothing to lose and they're not a terrible – I mean, they're an NFL team. So we know that they can get things together when they when they get a chance to and they can play some com- complimentary football. But I still think the AFC South, uh, contrary to the fact that they won three games uh, this week, is still the worst division in football. And I think the Colts are like the Falcons in the sense of just kind of like – they get they can steal a win from a great team, but all that does is kind of reset that great team. Like I thought, I thought the Chiefs' defense looked pretty good. Against, I mean, they sacked Mac, the they and sacked Matt Ryan Colts. five times in this game. Still, that's the biggest thing that worries me is they haven't been able to protect Matt Ryan in any game so far this season. And we know the Chiefs went out and tried to address pass rush a bit in the draft. And have Chris Jones there already, have Frank Clark, had guys we expect to perform. But this Colts offensive line has really started to come back to a reality that's far different than the perception we had about them. Yeah, I'm comfortable with where they're at. Even when they're – Colts, unfortunately for me, is just one of those teams that even when they're doing well, I don't believe – Maybe it is an AFC South thing in, 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 in general, but this is a tune-up game for the Chiefs, and I think they'll wake up. Because we Travis Kelsey had a great game. We saw some great uh, passes. I think one of the biggest Kansas City Chiefs plays for their offense was Patrick Mahomes' sidearm uh, throw to Juju Smith-Schuster that went for like 53 yards. That was a great play and like something to look forward to. But this, this loss in their season isn't going to mean much. So... I'd say this with the Colts. Still very worried about them. And Jacksonville seems legitimately like a live dog in this division now in a way that should worry the Titans and the Colts a lot because this Colts roster that's still really stout against the run, even without Shaquille Leonard on the other side at linebacker, lights out against the run. You saw Stephon Gilmore start to make some plays in the passing attack. But to me, this was also one that was more about Kansas City, who feels right now like they're caught between worlds a little bit. I think they got jobbed at the end of this game. They were about to force a punt for Matt Ryan in that offense before Chris uh, Jones got called for an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty after a sack that would have ended Indy's drive with five minutes to play because he said some bad words to Matt Ryan. I thought that was a weak-ass penalty and the refs inserting themselves where they need not be, and that's not just because that I had the Chiefs and the points in this game. But you look across the board in this game for Kansas City, Brandon, really inexplicably bad fake field goal attempt that resulted in a turnover on downs. Their kicker, because Harrison Butker is still injured, is Matt Amendola, who missed an extra point in the first half and a 34-yard field goal in the second half. Um, And then you had that moment at the end of the first half where the Chiefs handed the ball off to run out the clock to go into the half. They were getting the ball to start the second half, but Patrick Mahomes goes over and is openly jawing with their offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy. And when he got asked about this after the game, he said... 
listen, I'm an aggressive guy. I want to go out there and try and score. The smart move was probably to do what we did. But I think what you saw there, Brandon, was some of the friction that showed up already. It showed up for the Chiefs in that game against the Chargers on Thursday night where there were some spots where normally they have been all gas, no breaks, that now all of a sudden they started to tap on them a little bit. And we mentioned that with the fourth downs in that Thursday night game. And I think it showed up in moments like that. And for Pat Mahomes, who had to learn to play such a different brand of football last year because everyone wanted to go too high and keep plays in front of them. Who's learning to play a different brand of football again this year? Because there's no Tyreek Hill to bend those defenses now. And it's a little bit more on him. I think all of that is putting the team decision makers in an interesting spot because I think Andy Reid is feeling some of those differences in the way that he addresses those situations. But I think you've got a Pat Mahomes that at some point is going to like tell them, you got to just trust me on this and follow my lead because based on where the Chiefs are at, they're now back to the point where the margins are a little bit slimmer. And I know I've said this a couple times in reference to some teams, but when you don't have those game breakers at receiver we talked about, you put more on the plate of a guy like Pat. And if you're not willing to be aggressive in those critical areas where you have been, I feel like you forfeit some of that leverage that's for so long been part of Andy Reid and this Kansas City Chiefs brand as an offense and as a team is we're going to double down in all of those aggressive places and make you beat us the hard way instead of playing not to lose, which I think going into the half is why Pat was so frustrated with Eric Bieniemy. Yeah, that's fair. And I, I'm, I actually am just excited to see a little bit of friction on that sideline uh, uh, just because it's kind of like been this like perfect match. And Eric bien has been this guy who should be up for a bunch of different head coaching jobs, but he's still there and he seems to be happy. This is starting to be a little, st- see a little bit of friction, but I don't want to put all the onus and stuff on the offense there when that special teams, Mike, you talked about the blunders they had. They lost by three points and they had, what, seven points left out there on the field, not to mention – was it was it the first series of the game where Sky Moore? Uh, oh muffs, my uh, God! He muffed he muffed two punts. Sky Moore, he muffed two punts in that game, yes. but he muffed the first one that led directly to Indianapolis points. You're right; those were the other areas too, where a young guy coming in in that spot absolutely had a rough go of it, and they lost in the margins. That's I, I guess that's the biggest yeah. point. Is you're right, offense and defense might still be fine, but. It's a different world that the Chiefs are living in now, and I'm surprised that they're not operating the way they used to because I think it's more helpful for a team that's in the mold of who they are now to go and be aggressive in all those areas and to be a lot more sure-handed on special teams. That's a great point there. Um, Everyone who's not the Baltimore Ravens, stop kicking field goals. Field goal kickers did nothing but hurt teams this weekend. It was painful to watch. Justin Tucker goes out there and just effortlessly body bags 54-yard field goals in the game for the Ravens. He is the surest bet in sports. Everyone who doesn't have Justin Tucker, stop kicking the ball. Let your real players handle things. The Chiefs running a fake field goal? (laughs) Asinine. You have Patrick Mahomes on the payroll. You're giving him half a billion dollars. Let him throw the football. Don't let your backup... fourth and 11. Like... Let him throw the football. Why? Please, stop. I beg you. Um, Brandon, last one of the games that uh, made us go, hmm, was the Jags' thorough ass-whooping of the Los Angeles Chargers. They went out there and beat them. I think it was, what, 38-10 to ended up being the yeah, final yeah, yeah. score of this game. Uh-huh. And this is after they had gone out and skunked the... Indianapolis Colts the week before. The Jags snap an 18-game road losing streak. Um, the Chargers, and it, this is the question really for Jacksonville, Brandon, is not that if they are good. This is a legitimately good football team now. Doug Peterson is every yeah. bit of what we had hoped for. And honestly, when we do top five, bottom five tomorrow for the NFL, Urban Meyer, come mm-hmm. on down to my bottom five. Because looking at this roster now and how he was able to Man. make them so bad, I understand Trevor Lawrence was a rookie, and that jump from rookie year to the second year is supposed to be a pretty seismic one for everybody. And you went out and spent a bunch of money this offseason. But it shouldn't have looked that hopeless. And you shouldn't have been able to look that quarterback look that bad. And it's wild that you were able to. So just pencil that one in for tomorrow. But for the Chargers, and this is why we asked, how good are the Jags? Because I got a little froggy on Twitter, and I was like, the Jags look like a top-five team right now. They've gone out here, and they've handled competition. Um, Brandon, I, I want to say though, for context, like we talked about with the Colts, Alec Pierce and Michael Pittman were both out, so they didn't have anyone to throw to in that offense that struggles to protect the quarterback. True. 
But the Jags made them pay dearly for that. And in this game, the Chargers were dealing with a quarterback in Justin Herbert who had cracked rib cartilage. They were missing their center, Corey Lindsley, who's one of the best in the NFL. Keenan Allen at wide receiver. J.C. Jackson at cornerback. They lost Joey Bosa to a groin during this game. Rashawn Slater, their all-world left tackle who's in his second year, to a bicep injury during this game. And it led to, for Josh Allen, the other Josh Allen, the defensive end on the other side of the football out of Kentucky that's been over in Jacksonville, he had eight pressures Mm -hmm. in this game. It was a career high for him, leading the Jaguars in a pass rush that pressured Herbert on 30.4% of his dropbacks, according to NFL Next Gen Stats. Allen's now second to only Miles Garrett in quarterback pressures this season entering Sunday night football so he's been sensational and Brandon that's why I want to make sure we give the appropriate credit to Jacksonville because yes the teams they faced have been hurt in ways that really affected the output I don't think the Jags are 28 points better than the Chargers I think the Chargers are a really good football team who when fully healthy is better than the Jags but I think Jacksonville offensively has a quarterback who we're seeing this is the freak show and this is why you drafted him number one overall I think they spent money and some play. The Christian Kirk contract's always going to feel like more of a spend, but he's been super productive. Him, Zay Jones, Marvin Jones, those guys showed up and have made big plays around that offense. Evan Ingram as well in the tight end room there. But Brandon, that defense to me continues to shine. And Josh Allen is the tip of the spear as far as a guy who's shown up consistently in backfield so far this season. But Trayvon Walker, their number one overall pick out of Georgia, is a freaking mutant. He had the go-go gadget arm interception the last uh, game. He dropped back into coverage and broke up a pass in this game. Those guys on defense, Devin Lloyd, their uh, rookie first rounder out of uh, out of Utah, had an interception early in this game. They are fast and versatile up front, and they've been living in opposing backfields, Brandon. There's good bones and a good foundation on this team. And so I'll wait until I do the top five list with Dad in the middle of this week. I'm not sure I'm ready to go that far after a night's sleep, but... They're knocking on the door, Brandon. I mean, they're absolutely a team that you should be spending money on to win the AFC South right now, legitimately. I mean, and maybe even a little bit more than Mike, uh, more than that, Mike, because I'm looking at the numbers here on NFL.com and just you know total team stats. I mean, the numbers suggest that the the Jaguars are real in a very real sense. They they may Sacking be yeah. opposing quarterbacks seven times to only being sacked twice. Okay, nine touchdowns to the opposing quarterback, uh, opposing teams, five. Their total rush yards are uh, 370, holding the opponents to 165. James Robinson Fourth had a big, conversions, Mike. big run. That's, that's another area. James, you mentioned two of them at once. James Robinson busted off a 50-yard touchdown run on a fourth and one near midfield where they decided to go for it and absolutely knocked him out with it. I mean, people haven't. Pe- no one has converted a fourth down attempt on uh, the, these these Jaguars, and uh, they're just seventy fourth uh, first downs up until this point in time in the season. Mike is just plus seven in the turnover ratio. Like, like this is this is all signs that point towards a team that is doing all the right things, and it feels crazy in uh that they can just make that one little switch but Doug Peterson let's not forget the Super Bowl winning head coach Doug Peterson and the the seriousness that he must bring to the whole operation Mike I, I have a buddy Corey Peters who is uh, signed with the practice squad with the Jacksonville Jaguars and is about to get elevated soon to a defense that is is doing a lot of really great things. The biggest test for them will be next week, though, when they face the Eagles. That's going to be a great one o'clock game window, Mike, to see these Jacksonville Jaguars really test their mettle against the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, Philadelphia Eagles team, who could be the best team in football right now, as presently constructed. They're healthy and they're steamrolling people. They are so rock solid on both sides. But yeah, uh, listen, this team uh, they were second in DVOA at Football Outsiders last week, and could be number one this week. They beat the team that was number one in the buff, or sorry, the team that was number one in Buffalo lost. So they could be the analytical darling, the Jacksonville Jags. This is now a Jags and a Lions podcast. Everyone respond accordingly. Um, all right, Brandon, those are a lot of the highlights. There were a lot of really sloppy, ugly games. I don't want to look in the direction of what Atlanta did. We mentioned the Jets Bengals. Those games are, 
are weird and uncomfortable right. and all felt like they should have been played in London. So we're going to wait for that next weekend when we do start playing the London games and instead start handing out some roses on this podcast, Brandon. We are a podcast that Woo-hoo. appreciates the Bachelor and Bachelorette and Bachelor in Paradise franchise that it's getting ready to start up again. And understand that uh, yes. The Bachelor is sports, uh, and so we want to give out two roses every weekend. Coming in here on Monday, we each get two roses to some deserving member of the sports world or otherwise from over the weekend. So, Brandon, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start this off and head to the world of baseball. Because my favorite thing about baseball is when people do weird nice. shit. And okay. Robbie Ray, the uh, star left-hander for the Mariners, took part in a national anthem standoff in their game against the Royals over the weekend. Now, ignore the fact that they ended up blowing a uh, nine-run lead in that game and lost 13-12, to uh, which was not super cool, but baseball's all about weird shit. And we have seen this stuff really trickle up from college into the major leagues, the kind of rain delay shenanigans that go on during college baseball games, and things like this anthem standoff. Essentially, Robbie Ray took the field during the National Anthem, and he and Royals right-hander Luke Weaver both stood out there through the National Anthem and then went so far as to start and delay the start of the game, standing out there hand over heart with their hats off, waiting for the other to move. And this is one of those things, Brandon, where the umpires threatening to throw them out and eventually did. Like Robbie Ray, who wasn't scheduled to pitch for the next couple of days, got thrown out of this game After winning the National Anthem standoff, much to the delight of his entire dugout here, you have all of them goading him on, telling him you better not flinch no matter what happens, no matter what this ump threatens. And this is just one continued good vibes for the Seattle Mariners, who have been a really fun, delightful team. Big win streak around the All-Star break, obviously. J-Rod and what he's meant to baseball at the All-Star Home Run Derby, getting the big deal and staying in Seattle forever now. Seeing this moment was a good reminder that this can still be a dumb kids game when we allow it to be, and I'm glad these guys do. Baseball players are all like football specialists, which makes them a little bit weird in ways that I enjoy. I love that. I love. I didn't see that this happened, but I love that this happened because it's childish and it's important, and they won. The Seattle, well, Seattle the, won. Seattle did not win. No, they uh, they gave up. A, they gave up a nine. Well, they won that, and then they lost the game. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brandon, who's your rose? Game within a game, they won. Okay, yes. Uh, My rose, I don't really know who specifically to give this to. Maybe Devontae Smith, but I really want to give it to the entire Philadelphia Eagles team, Mike. The after Monday Night Football is over, they should be the only undefeated team in the NFC. <laughs> after I'm imagining that the Giants are going to uh, get handled by the, the Cowboys, but. I, I split it between the two if I want to do the full team because obviously Devontae Smith had a, a career game, eight receptions, 196, um, excuse me, 169 yards. I'm dyslexic and uh, shout out to 69 and a touchdown um, in, in this in this outing. Uh, but the defense, they sat Carson Wentz nine times, nine times and held the commander's offense that was really uh, – you know, hitting at all cylinders, scoreless until the fourth quarter when they only had eight points. Um, uh, they obviously the Eagles won twenty four to eight, but I just think that the 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 Philadelphia Eagles are are, are here. You talked to J- Jalen Hurts after the game. He says uh, he didn't know who to thank when it comes to the people in the offense. He said uh, offense. He said eighty eight, eleven, six, sixteen, three. All the running backs. Like, you're right. Amina Kimes is right. There's a stable around them. So he doesn't have to uh, – Jalen Hurts doesn't have to be good for the Eagles to be great. But the Eagles look great. They do look great. They look incredible from top to bottom. They've been as consistent as any team has been to start the season so far. And you're right. That commander's offense had been really potent, especially in the passing game at the beginning of the season. Carson Wentz in that roller coaster can have a lot of ups in addition to the downs. So – Rose to the Eagles, not going to fight that one, not for a minute. Um, Brandon, my second Rose, we already mentioned his name, goes to Dan Orlovsky. Could not be more happy for Dan. Dan, I hope you'll accept this Rose. So proud of you. You weathered the slings and arrows for so long of being the guy that ran out of the back of the end zone. It was your thing. You have gone out and done so many great things since then, and now you get to enjoy that a little bit more because you got to hand the baton to Jimmy Garoppolo. I'm glad that Dan Orlovsky was trending on Twitter during that game. I'm glad that Mike Tirico burped his name out before anything else could happen. 
And mostly I'm just happy that we're going to get to see both of those highlights all over TV, all today and tomorrow, and it's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great time. Everyone have fun. Everyone will have fun. Uh, Today, my second rose goes to Evan Peters, Mike. Do you know Evan Peters, the uh, actor, phenomenal phenomenal actor, Evan Peters? He played uh, Quicksilver in uh, Marvel, in the in the X-Men movie, but he was also in WandaVision as like the Quicksilver that kind of messed things oh, up. Did yeah. you ever watch WandaVision? Yes, I did. Loved WandaVision okay, yes, deeply. Yes, yes, yes. This, he's, a, he's, the, he's the kind of troubled child that uh, he's in, in Mayor of Easttown, but now he's recently in this Jeffrey Dahmer series that's on Netflix, Mike, that's very, very dark, very violent, very eerie, very scary, makes you feel wrong. If anyone needs uh, a break from football because it's just too graphic and too too dirty and too much of a, of a uh, guilty pleasure, click over to Netflix and watch this Jeffrey Dahmer uh, m- murder series by Ryan Murphy, your guy from Glee, who got everyone... He basically started all this American crime series and things like that. And Evan Peters is his Kobe Bryant to uh, Ryan Murphy's uh, Phil Jackson. Like, this is the one player that does all the things. Like, you talk about us being in college. I saw him for the first time in American Horror Story. And he's been killing it ever since in all of the American Horror Stories. So, shout out to Evan Peters, uh, St. Louis native. Uh, But this guy was born to act. And he is very, very creepy in this Jeffrey Dahmer uh, murder mystery series, whatever it is. Yeah, before Jordan Peele made the switch from comedy to horror, uh, I think Ryan Murphy was probably the most noteworthy going from on-screen musical drama to horror as his chief genre. It was wild and jarring, but you're right. He, uh, No doubt Evan Peters is his go-to guy on that. He's been phenomenal in so many things. So great roses. Great roses all around. Uh, if you got anyone you want to hand out, at Gojo Show on Twitter is where you can go ahead and do that. Um, we gave out picks uh, last weekend, Brandon. The Friday Thick Six or Pick Six. I couldn't remember what it was. Um, college college is happening under protest. So I give out six picks at the end of every week. College, we went with James Madison plus seven against App State, which was a win. They got that win outright, by the way. The Dukes with the upset over App State coming off two back-to-back emotional wins against Texas A&M and uh, Troy. USC minus five and a half versus Oregon State. That was a loss. Oregon State really tightly contested game. USC ends up winning a close one late. Caleb Williams leaves this great drive in the fourth quarter to win that game. They don't win by five and a half, which I was like, you know what? I understood. Oregon State, really good team that I hope more people will pay attention to what they're doing out in Corvallis. The one that pissed me off was this. Utah was playing Arizona State, who had just fired Herm Edwards, who was one of the worst rush defenses in college football, and who I figured was ready to kind of, you know, turn things in for the year based on what goes on and how difficult it is going on and playing after your coach has been fired. Tavion Thomas. The tree's in there. Yes. Tavion Thomas is a large running back for the Utah Utes. One of the best players on their team, a guy who they brought back from last year who was super important to their squad. And the over-under on rush touchdowns for him was a half. And so I thought, sure, that's a layup in this game. Arizona State's legitimately in like the one-teens or one-twenties as far as rush defense nationally in, co- nationally in college football. Come to find out as I turn on this game at halftime and look at the rusting stats, and he's nowhere to be found, that for some reason he was held out of the game for the first half. And I don't know if it was for disciplinary reasons or what, but he got in there and was playing the entire second half in a game that they had already been blowing out Arizona State in, so weren't going to see more opportunities, many more opportunities down around the goal line. So could not have seen that coming. College football is weird because they don't have to give you injury reports or actual information 90% of the time. And so that felt like bullshit, which is why I gave myself an extra pick on the NFL front. We went Chiefs minus 5.5 against the Colts, lost that one. Ravens minus 2.5 at New England, that was a dub. Green Bay Tampa under 42, easy dub. And then we added the Detroit Lions plus 6.5, who looked like they were going to win that outright for the majority of that game. Lost, valiant effort, great teams cover. The Lions and Dan Campbell were able to do that. Might have to just do a Dan Campbell Lions bet of the week every week and find some way to incorporate one of our favorite teams into the mix. So on the pick six plays, we went three and three plus one with the Lions bet. So seven fifteen and two or eight fifteen and two, depending on how you see that on the year. So we're climbing back out of the cellar right now. Still not great, but 
working out of Fade Gojo territory, which is where we had lived going into this weekend. I think if you continue to put your money on a team that can and will, we'll continue to turn around this uh, thick pick six picks. That's all we want, man. We want to be the podcast that can and will. And that's what we can do through the power of one pride, the Detroit Lions. Um, Brandon, the other group and the other entity that can and will, very good friend of ours that wants to make sure that you not only can look good, but you will look good, is our friends at Knock Around Sunglasses. And we've been telling you about them a lot, guys, as Brandon puts them on for the YouTube audience right now. But we want to keep telling you about them because they support us, and so we hope you'll support them. And we've seen a lot of you tweet pictures at us at Gojo Show on Twitter of you looking great in your knock around sunglasses. Polarized sunglasses that yes. cost just around $30 a pair. What a bargain. What a deal. You see how stunning Brandon is right now. You can look like Brandon too with 15 different frames, a variety of colors. You can pick out something that works for you. You can customize the front, the arms, the logo, the lenses, all the above. You can design pairs for game day, just going out. You can design pairs for going out in a run. Runner's World Magazine named them a 2021 Editor's Choice. They are lightweight, they have great clarity, and they've got that little rubber thing on the nose so it doesn't slip and slide and move around on you. You can do dynamic head stuff. It's all on the table. All on the table. Knockaround sunglasses are high-quality polarized sunglasses at a truly affordable price. Check out their huge range of shades at knockaround.com and use promo code GOJO. Going to get you 20% off at checkout. That's knockaround.com, promo code GOJO for some of the best polarized sunglasses around. 20% off at checkout, promo code GOJO. Brandon, now to the important part of the day. Sunglasses on, feeling good, looking better. Do you know what time it is, Brandon? Yeah, I'm Skippy, I do, Mike. I don't want another pretty face. I don't want just anyone to hold. I don't want my love to go to waste. I want you this, that, and the third. You're the one I want to chase. You're the one I want to hold. I want to let another minute go to waste. I want you this, that, and the third. I haven't thought about Jesse McCartney in a long time. <laughs> like, You're welcome. I know we got to take a walk down memory lane with the Rihanna Super Bowl announcement, but Jesse McCartney might have even taken me further back into the vault. Oh, man. It was good. That song was good. That song was really good. Good little guitar riff in the background. It just all felt really nice. And if you enjoyed how that sounded and felt, download, subscribe, rate, and review Gojo wherever you get your podcast. Five-star rating. Review it. Tell Brandon how much you love the work he does on this, that, and the third. And, uh, Brandon, why don't we get to this um, and start things off. The quest for 61 home runs that has preoccupied the world of baseball so much that... The powers that be also thought it should preoccupy the world of college football. I don't know if you saw when the Yankees were playing over the weekend. They did live cut-ins during the Clemson football game and other games on Saturday to the home runs that pissed off a lot of college football fans who did not give a shit if Aaron Judge hits 61 or 1 home runs. Um, Thought it was hilarious watching it forced on the college football audience. Aaron Judge still sitting pretty at 60 right now. Uh, they won a rain-shortened game 2-0 against the Red Sox Sunday night where Judge went 1-2 for two with a double and was due up when the Yankees game got stopped for uh, stopped because of weather. So it's going to keep going. And Brand- it's starting to get to an interesting territory where I do wonder now, one, how many legitimate cracks of this he's had because we've seen some pitchers who are more than content to just go up there and walk him, give him the bonds treatment that you would expect. But the other part of this that I'm sure is also a really big mental load for a guy who is trying to maintain that he is going out. We've heard Aaron Boone, their manager, saying he's focused on winning games. He's not focused on this. He's a human being. He knows what's at stake right now. And I've got to imagine it is impossible to wake up, breathe, eat, shit, or do anything without thinking of this record. So I hope he can get it done soon, if nothing else, so he can have a sigh of relief. Because the longer this goes, the tougher it's going to be. And what a shame if somehow, sitting here on the finish line, he wasn't able to get over the edge. 
I think we might be there, Mike. Honestly, like I was watching this Friday night baseball game against uh, in Yankee Stadium against the Red Sox. We obviously had a game watch uh, with Jared Kravis in, in the Baseball's Dead podcast and the Jared Kravis podcast uh, out in Boston. But um, at the end of that game, Mike, when he didn't tie or surpass the tie, he looked like the happiest person on the damn field. Like he he was he looked like he was relieved that this game was over and he can get out of there without having to continue to perform because he had a bad night uh, batting and he hasn't obviously home runs doesn't mean that you you're having a bad night or not hitting a home run doesn't mean you're having a bad night but he hasn't had great nights and I think it is I think it is kind of it's more of the yips on a historical fashion to the point where I think Aaron Judge might just stop here. Like, he had a great September. It may stop in September. Yeah, so he's got more opportunities. He's gone five games without a home run since hitting 60 against the Pirates. He's gone four of 15 with three doubles, six walks, and six strikeouts in that time. The Yankees have a three-game series that starts today uh, with the Blue Jays. They've got three more games against Baltimore next weekend, and then they wrap up the regular season at Texas. So Judge is also on the cusp of the Triple Crown for the AL. He's in some big-time stuff. He's got opportunities, Brandon. I think law of averages, there's no way he makes it out of the regular season without eclipsing this record. But the stress, I'm sure, is great for Major League Baseball as people keep tuning in. Just stop bitching so much about when it's on Friday Night Baseball. It's free and Katie Nolan's wonderful. Y'all leave her alone, you jackals. We're bummed that Katie didn't get to call that home run. I wanted her to be a part of history. But I digress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, support Katie Nolan. We love Katie Nolan around here. Aggressive. Um, Brandon, let's get to that. Uh, That little news out of the world of golf, the President's Cup between the United States and the international team went off. And it really wasn't a question of, in most people's minds, if the U.S. was going to win, but when. And didn't happen quite as fast as most people would have expected, but um, Jordan Spieth, Patrick uh, Cantlay, Tony Finau, and others, a part of a great win for the American side. The five-point margin of victory was the American's second largest in the most recent 30-point iteration of the event. They're now 10-0-1 in the last 12 President's Cups since 2000. Um, But Brandon, most of the story for this is, again, the international team being without a bunch of guys that are now over on the Live Tour and the continued specter that it has around the sport of golf you know the president's cup's fun it's one of those international events like the Ryder cup where you get a little bit of team aspect involved in golf you get some shit talking guys are a little bit looser and so that part's always fun but it's gonna be interesting again how these sorts of competitions continue to involve the live guys or not involve the live guys going forward i mean it's like i always say mike america fuck yeah Coming again to save the motherfucking day, yeah. Um, Brandon, let's get to the third, though. This is the most important and most egregious of what we've seen uh, in the world. I don't know why you put this in here, Mike. Because I was obviously going for Duke in this matchup. But please continue. You, you, you can root for Duke all you want. They didn't go out there and handle business. The Kansas Jayhawks in college football handled business. And the latest AP Top 25 poll came out this weekend after the week four of college football. And no surprise, Georgia's still holding it down at the number one spot, despite a little bit of a closer outing than expected against Kent State. Bama rolls, Ohio State rolls, Michigan and Clemson both played close ones, as did USC. Um... You had Oklahoma. Tennessee in the top 10. Tennessee up in the top 10 at number 8. Kentucky and Tennessee, 7 and 8. Oklahoma State and NC State round out the top 10 at 9 and 10, respectively, with Penn State, Utah, and Oregon knocking on the door. Oklahoma drops from 6 to 18. And Brandon, Kansas State, fresh off an upset win in Norman against the formerly sixth ranked Sooners, moves into the top 25 at 25. The Kansas Jayhawks, who are undefeated and as of right now at the top of the Big 12 Conference, 1-0 in conference play and 4-0 on the year, still not ranked because the AP voters either don't know or don't care. And that sort of cowardice is bullshit. I don't wish anything really truly bad on anyone, Brandon. I believe in karma enough to not do that. But I hope most of the AP voters who voted to not have Kansas in their top 25 stub their toe walking around their kitchen or lose their car keys for an extended portion of the afternoon tomorrow because you stink and you're making this really unfun in a way it doesn't need to be. That is a legitimately good Kansas team. If you didn't check out the basketball matchup against Duke this weekend, shame on you for missing what they went out there and put together. It was 
it's been fun, Brandon. They're what college football is supposed to be about is people bitch and complain about all the money that's coming into college sports. Then you get to Kansas and you choose not to support them. That's where you want to be when Jesus comes home, AP? Not ranking Kansas? Good mm. luck. That's a good That's a good point, Mike. You threw me off because I was thinking, dang, like, do I have a wet part of history that I want to be on when Jesus comes? You know, and, you know, he's probably not going to be very tall. All right, but listen, so listen. The problem is what I heard you say was it's a very good Kansas team. And I think in the top 25 has to be very good college football teams. So I understand they are a very good college football team. I I understand they look like one. I understand they act like one. I'm sure they uh, they're doing all the things they need to to be one. But so was UCF for a very long time when they couldn't get in the top 25. So I think uh they have an opportunity to get up there with this schedule, Mike, because they have a lot of people that are ranked, a lot of opportunities to upset, a lot of opportunities to continue to, to embarrass other Big 12 teams that are currently ranked. But it may be until the end of the season, uh, which is completely unfair. Yeah, I'm with you on that. It's ridiculous. And it's the bottom half of the top 25. Go ahead and do the right thing at some point here. Check out this team if you haven't checked them out already. Jalen Daniels, their quarterback, is sensational. Threw for 324, ran for 83 more in their game this weekend against Duke. Guys, lights out. They run kind of that fun Coastal Carolina spread spread option offense that's become pretty popular. Watch good football. But Watch good football. But they don't have Adrian Martinez, which Kansas State has, who is the definition of electric, Mike? I, I, I'm I'm a big fan. If you watch Jalen Daniels, he is every bit as electric. Now, Adrian Martinez deserves a ton of credit for what he pulled off for K-State on the road. Going and surviving Nebraska, which we clearly see was not all Adrian Martinez's fault, the results that were coming out there. But um, rank the Jayhawks. You ranked Kansas State, rank the entire state of Kansas, you gutless cowards over at the AP, or the rest of us in college football media will continue to come over and light small fires around your office place. If you also believe that the state of Kansas should be ranked, and you stuck around long enough to hear me complain about it, make sure you check us out. Download, subscribe, rate, and review Gojo wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a five-star rating and a review. Head on over to the DraftKings YouTube channel and hit subscribe. Make sure you check out the Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. tab on that as well. We got all our interviews going up visually so you can see me wear cutoffs and watch Brandon wear old, obscure football jerseys in front of a purple and black wall. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy Monday Night Football. We'll talk to you tomorrow.